Fire Emblem Three Houses was widely well received for its inventive approach to some age-old mechanics within the series. Its calendar system allowed for a more controlled approach to managing your units and their progression, but more than anything, it allowed a far more intimate story than previous installments. For me, Three Houses quickly rose to become my favorite game in the entire series, and certainly the game with the best characters by far. Even Lucina, who I had adored for her tragic backstory and hopeful attitude, still pales in comparison to some of the best cast in this game, at least as far as consistent characterization and overall depth. I've spent the last several weeks in an internal debate on which character I wanted to cover with this video. Dimitri is my favorite due to his Shakespearean quality tragic backstory, and Claude's enigmatic nature would have made him an interesting subject altogether. Even Rhea, with her silent insanity, would have been an incredibly interesting take, but one name kept repeating in my head over and over. With this in mind, I decided to focus on a character that I struggle with a little bit more. Let's get the spoiler warning out of the way, because this is going to be a very in-depth look at a character throughout their entire experience in the game, in every single route. This video will be filled to the brim with me trying to make my MFA worth something, so steal yourself for some literary jargon. Hail the mighty Edelgard, the red blood stains her story. Heavy as her crown may be, she will lead a soul to glory. I hate Edelgard. I think she's hypocritical and stubborn cruel and unwieldy, and overall, not a very good person. And also, I love Edelgard. She is earnest, caring, powerful, ambitious, wise beyond her years, and an incredible advocate for equality in a world built on a structurally classist society. And if those two sentiments sound contradictory, I would say it's a result of how masterfully executed the character actually is. But to understand why Edelgard works, we have to first understand how Fire Emblem Three Houses works primarily in the way that it tells its story. Three Houses focuses on the perspective of its main character, Byleth, who primarily functions as a surrogate for the player. Uh, I'm sure you all know by now, Byleth becomes the professor at Garrig Mach Monastery, where the students of this game um, are learning to fight in battles similar to previous Fire Emblem games with a sort of SRPG approach. This focus on a surrogate character is positive for obvious reasons. It gives the player direct control over the events they're going to be playing out, and in a much more dramatic way than it did in perhaps Fire Emblem Fates. But from a narrative angle, because you're fundamentally involved in the formative years of the main cast, the seemingly massive changes in their personalities are immediately justified, because their experiences are going to be largely different depending on how you, as the player, approach the game. I would argue that Edelgard is actually the best example of this, because in three of the four routes that you can play, she's going to be your enemy. But even the type of enemy that she serves as is heavily influenced by which route you choose. Blue Lions, for instance, is primarily a story about Dimitri, and it's also a story about Edelgard, and how her actions and their relationship created the version of Dimitri that you'll be traveling with throughout the Azure Moon chapters. Uh, the Golden Deer branch, on the other hand, is a bit more removed from Edelgard's personal history, making her less of a direct antagonist to Claude, and more of a sort of general obstacle in the face of his ambitions. This is the difference between a character that we come to have intimate knowledge of, versus a larger-than-life dictator who we hope to defeat. And Edelgard's structure as a character is so malleable that she fits into these roles fairly well, without any sort of suspension of disbelief really being necessary. Finally, there's Crimson Flower, a route that focuses on Edelgard herself, and it's fought from the perspective of her army. It also gives insight into the hidden depth of her knowledge and her ambitions. In order for any of this to work, the key is consistency. Edelgard has to have similar personality traits no matter which route you're playing. Thankfully, this is yet another area where Three Houses excels. But before we dive into that, let's talk about who Edelgard is, externally and internally. Edelgard von Hressvelg is the successor to the Imperial Throne of Embar, capital of Adrestia. The Adrestian Empire is the longest standing human society in Fodland with the exception of the underground secret city of Shambhala. 
Because of this, Edelgard is raised to believe that her future, Fodlin's history, and Fodlin's future are one and the same. Her delusions of grandeur aren't something developed from her own ego, rather something pushed upon her externally. Her perception of self comes from a sense of duty instilled within her from a young age. Internally, she's ravaged by loss and despair, having lost almost all of her siblings to vile experimentation, her relationship with Dimitri, who she'd become close to, being torn away from her, the compounding of these various truths bring about a sense of profound loneliness, and yet still inspires ambition unlike most other characters in both. This sort of framing is essential in any character arc. For a character to grow and change, they have to first overcome what is often referred to as the lie that they believe. This core concept implies that the start of a character arc has them believing something assuredly false about themselves and or the world around them, and that their growth is centered around disproving or deconstructing that lie. Edelgard, as a character, is kind of prepackaged with a few of these. First is the lie that only she can change the world for the better. This is reinforced by her disdain for the church, a force within the game that makes up the vast majority of the world's order. Of course, the realization of a character and the conclusion of their arc demands that the lie they believe be dismantled. Now, this is how traditional character arcs are structured. Edelgard is a fascinating case because, again, only one of the four arcs actually has her reaching a state of self-actualization, and that would be Crimson Flower. This particular lie, though, the lie that she's the only one who can change the world, is actually not dismantled in the one route within the game where her arc is completed. Edelgard still insists on being the one to change the world, and clearly believes it was a duty assigned to her at birth. So how, then, does she have a complete arc without deconstructing the lie that she believes. Well, it's simple. If you can't change the truth, you simply change the lie. Edelgard has a second lie, and I believe it makes up the worst parts of her personality. It's a belief that she holds in three of the four arcs of this game, that despite her ambition, being for the betterment of all mankind, her plans have no room for mercy or empathy. This is a lie reinforced not by outside forces, but by her own actions. For reference, see the second battle at Grander Field, and with it, the way Edelgard readily sacrifices characters like Bernadetta and Petra for her own gain. These aren't just soldiers in her army, mind you. These are her friends, people that she spent her time at Garrig Mach becoming increasingly close to over quite a stretch of time. When I said that I hated Edelgard earlier, this is the character that I meant. A character so vile and stubborn that in the face of the people she's victimized, her tunnel vision can only ever focus on her own goals. And yet, I also love this version of Edelgard as a character too, because she is merciful, able to cultivate the talents of those around her, and despite methods I don't agree with, she truly does seek to change the world for the better. But how can these ideas exist simultaneously? Well, that's the easy part. As I stated earlier, in order to complete Edelgard's character arc, she has to overcome the lie that she believes. Because a lot of the various philosophies on character writing are built around novels and screenwriting, they typically imply a linear narrative. Obviously, that makes sense in the context of a book or a movie, as you're typically experiencing exactly that. A narrative with a clear beginning, middle, and end. It's set in stone from the time you go in to view it. But Fire Emblem Three Houses, being a video game, has the rare opportunity to create a dynamic narrative that changes based on player actions and decisions, and as a result of this, characters actually have dynamic arcs. For Edelgard, for instance, the difference between the routes you choose are the difference between a flat arc and a hero's journey. To elaborate on that further, a flat character arc is typically where a character remains functionally the same throughout an entire narrative. Goku, for instance, is a great example of this. They are seldom changed by the world or by other characters in the narrative. This would be Edelgard in the Blue Lion Path, for instance. She's unwavering in her ideals, consistently decisive and immovable throughout the entire story. 
As a result of this, the world is far more often changed by her. She starts the war, she corrupts Dimitri, divides the Alliance, sets every major action in the game's story in motion, barring those determined by those who slither in the dark. The person that she is ultimately means more to the story than the person she could possibly become. This also makes her a great villain, because characters like Dimitri have to undergo more traditional positive arcs in order to overcome her. He has to challenge his relationship with her without her doing her share of the work. Edelgard is a character who is largely informed by her relationships. Those relationships, in my opinion, falling into two categories. Those who do things for her, such as Hubert, Byleth, and the Crimson Flower Root, uh, or Ferdinand von Eyre, or her uncle Arendelle. And those who do things to her, Dimitri, Rhea, Byleth, and every non-Crimson Flower Path, and Uncle Arendelle. I hate the guy, but his presence in both categories is a big part of who Edelgard becomes. Arendelle is without doubt the most impactful person in her life because he sets her on the path that changes her forever. First by experimenting on and subsequently killing her siblings, and then by cultivating that darkness in her heart and urging her to leverage the likes of the Death Knight and Solon in her quest for power. Edelgard's masked alter ego, the Flame Emperor, is quite literally a product of Arendelle's machinations. Perhaps the second most impactful relationship that Edelgard has is of course the one that she shares with Byleth. Uh, the depth of that relationship is ultimately down to player choice and will ultimately determine the quality of Edelgard's life as well as the success of her ambitions. I like how heavily people in Edelgard's life influence her decisions, because I think it serves to emphasize her truly empathetic nature. I mean, she cares for others, and is fundamentally chasing what she deems to be everyone in the world's ideal outcome. Of course, she's wrong in a lot of ways, but in a large part, that's the point. For her to be this antagonistic force that has this sense of ambition that can only be described as palpable in every interaction, she also has to be a little bit incorrect in her philosophy, or at least her execution of her belief system. Edelgard is incorrect, sure, but she believes she's right, and I don't think there's a single interaction in the entire game that doesn't reinforce that idea. I've often heard the argument made that Byleth is a character who teaches Edelgard the value of mercy. This is a direct contrast to a belief that drives her forward, that mercy has no place in her war. In Crimson Flower, we watch this manifest as the lie that Edelgard believes. The lie is deconstructed throughout part two of that timeline. For example, the battle between Edelgard and Lysithia during their last stand against Master Tactician Claude. Or that in Crimson Flower, Edelgard actually has the opportunity to spare Claude's life. This is the part of the story that I actually find to be quite sad. One of the reasons that Edelgard is so insistent on bearing the burden of responsibility is because she's rarely been shown genuine empathy or compassion from just about anyone in her life. I mean, there was Dimitri, but that relationship was torn away from her against her will. Every ounce of goodwill Arendelle shows is just a backhanded attempt at gaining more power for himself. I mean, even Hubert, who genuinely does care deeply for Edelgard, unless you progress their supports in Crimson Flowers specifically, is typically a very transactional character in the way that he behaves with her. A lot of this is based on his own perception of his station, but that would be another video entirely. The first time she really feels at home anywhere is with her classmates and her professor, and she loses out on all of that if Byleth rejects her at the game's midway point. Of course that would drive someone to stubborn madness. It's not just Byleth that she wants the approval of, it's everyone. She wants the entire world to bow down to her, not because she wants to subjugate everyone, but because she wants people to believe that she has their best interest at heart. She'd never admit it, I think, as a character, but I think Edelgard is the type of person to fear her own potential weakness more than just about anyone else. The beautiful irony in Three Houses is that there are a great many characters with overlapping views and ideals, and yet they're so polarized in their relationships with each other because ultimately, 
almost all of them have an ends-oriented ideology rather than a means-oriented one. Rhea, Dimitri, and Edelgard are three passionate, violent forces that believe the outcomes are what matter, and whether it takes sacrificing your friends or burning down a town or torturing your foes, that the methods are inconsequential so long as that goal is met. In the past within the game where these respective lords are heroes, they survive ultimately because they overcome that mentality. I mean, Edelgard and Dimitri are incapable of surviving in any route that isn't their own. And I think that speaks a lot to the way that their mentalities are received by the world at large. For Edelgard to achieve victory, she has to undergo the hero's journey, dispelling the lie that has taken hold over her life. This singular instance of a positive arc for her is ultimately the most fleshed out version of her that we see, because the facade is broken down, both by other people in her life finally getting close to her, and by her ambition taking hold and the inspiration for her entire character being laid bare for all to see. This game is making some pretty explicit statements about the nature of war and ends-oriented ethics. A lot of it is to say that waving a flag for a noble cause doesn't inherently excuse the actions said cause demands. While Three Houses is never afraid to vocalize these subjects through character dialogue around Garrick Mock, its clearest vehicle is obviously one of its most ambitious characters. So I'll say it again, to bookend it all. I hate Edelgard, because of the pain she puts her friends through when she keeps them out, because she turns this incredible SRPG gameplay into a painful crawl toward the execution of someone I've been trained to respect and admire, and I love Edelgard, because she's the most honest and impactful antagonistic force Fire Emblem has had since the GBA era. And because the depth of her character goes so much further than just villain, because she, just by being who she is, elevates the rest of this story from a classic video game narrative to a genuinely riveting war drama with a sense of dignity and character that exceeds its genre, to become, in my eyes, an instant classic. Thank you all for tuning in for this character study, a new approach to making videos for me for sure, but something I definitely plan to try again. Once I finish the remaining Yakuza games, I'm definitely going to give Kiryu a try, because uh, he's certainly a fascinating one as well. So if you're into this sort of thing, please feel free to like the video and subscribe to make sure you're around when I make more like it. In the meantime, check out these other recent works of mine, and make sure to come back soon for more from The Game Room.